Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Health. Objective 1. Obamacare! Objections to national health care are late and will do nothing to reduce costs. As has resulted from mandatory, in some cases, health care insurance, the costs have escalated because the marketplace was undermined. Once the captive audience, mandatory insurance, was implemented, costs could only go up. If health care were left in the free market, there would still be hospitals, doctors, and producers of prescription drugs. They would, however, have to provide their services at prices that were reasonable and manageable. Otherwise, they would have no customers. Absent customers, they would lower their prices or look for new work. Supply and demand is the best manager of costs. Supply and demand allows us, the consumers, to determine what appropriate and acceptable costs are. Once removed from our hands, the value of the service was also removed. The problem is that Congress usurped authority that was not granted by the Constitution by adopting socialism as a means of buying votes. There is no constitutional authority to require businesses to provide mandatory health insurance, nor is there authority now to implement national health care. Objective 2. Abortion. Abortion is a moral issue. It is not a federal matter, but is, or was, in the purview of state and or local governments. That is the nature of the Constitution, as understood by the Founding Fathers. Federal crimes were limited to those enumerated in the Constitution, and those that were passed in accordance with Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. In Roe v. Wade, 410 U.S. 113, Justice Rehnquist's dissenting said, quote, the court necessarily has had to find, within the scope of the 14th Amendment, a right that was apparently completely unknown to the drafters of the amendments. In 1868, there were at least 36 laws enacted by state or territorial legislatures limiting abortion. The only conclusion possible from this history is that the drafters did not intend to have the 14th Amendment withdrawn from the states the power to legislate with respect to this matter. Close quote. The problem is that the Supreme Court has become a legislative authority in their country. It has used its position of power to aid in the usurpation of both state and individual rights, reverting the people to the role of subjects, as they were under British rule. Objective 3. Genetically Modified 
organisms, GMOs. The Food and Drug Administration has determined, without any more than administrative consent from Congress, what is good and what is bad in our food supply. Once those few people make the decision, regardless of the source or influence behind the idea, it becomes law. And we have to eat it, unless we grow our own food. Some suggest that we will not be allowed to grow our own food, but that aside, we have lost quality food from retail sources, unless small and local, and in most cases, cannot even find out, without extensive research, what they have been doing to that food supply. If we get rid of the agency, we still have thousands of food production companies that have implemented the programs and will be reluctant to withdraw from what they have gotten used to. The problem is that an administrative agency, the FDA, has been granted extraordinary power, authority, and budget funds to decide what we eat, regardless of who benefits and who suffers because of their decisions. In reviewing these issues, and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it. Each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100% not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believed to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually to defeat would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed, when that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. 
We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms or defeat by failure to be willing to fully commit to the cause.